This week's Torah portion is Shemot. Shemot. Now, uh, before I get into translating it, I want to contextualize it, which is we have finally finished last week. We did the last Torah portion in the book of Genesis. We right. Now, we are now in a new book. This is the opening right. of the book. It's called the book of what? We are now in a new book called the book of Exodus. This week's Torah portion is Shemot. Now, that's the Hebrew for it. And before I go into translating it, which will be very important and central to what I want to discuss uh, in this video, in this session, we are finally out of the book of Genesis, the book of Bereshit. Uh, we, we finished last week, was the last Torah portion in the book of Genesis, and now we are now entering the book of, the English translation is called Exodus. Now, I'll tell you why that's not really an accurate, it, it's, a, it's a useful term for this book, since, uh, spoiler alert, later on in the book of Exodus, the Jews make their exodus out of Egypt. They start off this book, the way, the way we finished the book of Genesis last week was that the Jews were settled, the children of Israel, the Israelites had settled in Egypt. Things were good because Joseph, their brother, was he had a high place of power and ultimately their father died and things are, things are going well. The way this book opens up is a very different setting. And it, it sort of rushes through saying, yeah, it was good. That's how things were. But then later on, a, a new Pharaoh arose who didn't know Joseph. So the, the I don't know, the, what was accorded to the, to the Israelites, to the Bene Israel, to, to the, basically our ancestors, the Israelite ancestors, had been forgotten. Yeah, Joseph had a special place, but who he's forgotten by the ruling power. So, spoiler alert, later on in the book of Exodus, ultimately it's a bad situation and the Jews need to get out. But <clears throat> I'm not gonna go into that now. I actually- All of them for those places, but I don't know where those places I are. Actually, um, I actually want to talk about uh, the naming of it. And the names are really the central part of our discussion today. Now, I mentioned the book in English is typically called this. The book is called Exodus, in which the Jews later depart. But the literal translation of the Hebrew of Shemot, which is also the same word as our Torah portion, is the uh, is names. Because in in Hebrew, the word for uh, for name is shame. And plural is Shemot. Okay, so I'm going to show us, uh, and, and names actually, I, I thought it was just haphazard until I took a, another look at it for this, for this presentation, is names actually keep popping up and are important. So I want to start off with looking at, where are we here? Okay, so we have here, uh, really we start off, now Technically, it's called Shemot because it's the second word. Um, it's right here. The second word is Shemot, is, uh, is names. And that's a typical naming convention as we see from Torah portion to Torah portion, as well as from each of the books in the Torah. That's why it's called. It's just really one of the first names. But it actually works Rabbi, out well for this week's Torah portion. Rabbi, can you yeah. hear me? I very Rabbi. much can hear you. So as is a typical naming convention, for the Torah portions, we have the <coughs> the names. Um, we have the names, right? So we have. This is uh, we're, okay, so as we see, as is typical for naming conventions in each of the Torah portions, this is one of the very first words in the Torah portion, which is Shmot. Okay, very simple. What's really fascinating is literally in this first verse, it 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 reminds us of what we experienced in. The book of Genesis. These are the names, right? We have on the English side. I could say in Hebrew, Israel, Okay, these are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt. Now, what we have is each of the literally each of the names: Reuben, Simon, Levi, Yehuda, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Don, Naphtali, God, and Asher. Okay, it doesn't. It obviously omits Yosef, but. If we hearken back, if we remember back in the Torah portion, which we see 
It was the one in which Rachel and Leah were fighting over attention from their husband of Jacob. But each of them are not haphazardly named. Each of them are intentionally named. And if we remember, they each have a particular reason for why they were named the name that they were. And that was very intentional. But here it doesn't go into why each of them received the names that they received. It's just almost like a mnemonic device. It's a mnemonic device of here are the names. We don't have to go into the background as to why they, these, these sons were named that way, but it, it reminds us to check back. Okay, so that's, it starts off, literally starting off with names and significant names because these are the heads of the tribes of Israel. Then we have very shortly thereafter, we have the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other of whom was named Pua. And this is part of the story because the, the Pharaoh is feeling threatened by this potential fifth column of these, of these Hebrews. Like, who are these Hebrews? I'm really concerned. We need to kill these boys. And so he said, when you deliver the Hebrew women, look at the birth stool. If it is a boy, kill him. If it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, fearing God did not do as the king of Egypt had told them, they let the boys live. Now, the names here really stand out because they are not really typical Hebrew names. I don't know if, the, I think one is a Canaanite name and the other is, I don't know if it's Akkadian or Aramaic, but it's not, it is not a typical Hebrew name in that already is sort of ringing, uh, I want to say ringing alarms. Already some, something's going off. It's intriguing uh, as to what's, what the deal is. Now, I will say, I will take a moment and say that the rabbis really are curious about these names and they, because they do stand out, something's off, not necessarily off, anomalous with these names of Shifra and Pua. And so they come up with various midrashim, various uh, other explanations as to what uh, what they what their names are and what they mean. But names names are significant here. Now moving on, we get to chapter two, and this is the perhaps this is a, a famous story where Moses' mom gives birth to him in secret, and but then sends him off down the Nile. Now, they sent him off down the Nile in this basket, and the daughter of Pharaoh comes down to bathe in the Nile. She sees this basket, opens it. it must, she, she knows it seems to be a Hebrew child, but then, nevertheless, she has mercy upon this child. And uh, ultimately, Pharaoh's daughter says, take this child, nurse it for me. I will pay your wages. So that's what happens. When the child grows up, so, so this boy grows and is brought back to Pharaoh's daughter, who basically adopts him as a son, and she names him Moses, explaining, I drew him out of the water. because It's funny, people have, uh, so my name is Drew. It's really a nickname for Andrew, but I go by Drew. The funny thing people like to joke is that uh, they either call me Moses or Moshe because I'm, I've been drawn, right? Uh, um, you could, I guess, also alternatively translate Moshe as Drew. This is Drew because she drew this boy out of the water. I, I don't know if any if that's really caught on, but I like that. I think it's funny uh, because she has drawn him out of the water. So maybe his name would be Drawn and not really Drew. But I think that's a, I like that translation, but I'm also biased by my name. So that's his name. I, I also think it's really deeply fascinating that this, uh, that Moshe, or as I like to call him, Drew, was not given a name by his birth mother. The whole time, it's just simply called this child, this son, this boy, but never is he actually given a name by his birth mother? which, or birth father for that matter. No name is given really until Pharaoh's daughter adopts him. I think that's deeply fascinating because 
I would have imagined that there would be a name, but it's really the name of the context of his uh, adoption, uh, really in an Egyptian context and not a Hebrew context. So he really has his identity formed as Egyptian and not as Hebrew. Okay, so that's, that's Moses' name, or as I like to call him, the Drew of the Bible. <coughs> now we get later on in, in chapter two, it's actually towards the end of chapter two. So Moses, this is much later on in Moses' life. He grows up and then he has to flee from Egypt because he's uh, killed an Egyptian taskmaster. Okay, so ultimately Moses consented to stay with the man, or we could also call him Drew. Uh, Drew consented to stay with the man and he gave Drew his daughter Zipporah as wife. Now we, we're not given an explanation as to why her name is Zipporah, um, but she gave birth to a son and called that son Gershom because, and she gives a reason, Ki amar ger haiti be'eretz I have I have been a stranger in a foreign land. So ger and shom, if we were to take these as, it's, it's one word, but really we, if we think about it as two separate words. So ger is uh, sojourn. It says stranger, which we could understand it as stranger, or we can think about it as uh, sojourning uh, and shom, which could really be more understood accurately as sham, as there, meaning I was a stranger there. Now, interestingly, it's a, it, uh, Moshe, Moses is given the, he, he gets the opportunity for the naming. So it's not really clear for Moses about what the strange land is what this foreign land is, although I, I would argue that really the strange land, it, although it could be understood as Egypt is a strange land, but he really came up in an, in an Egyptian context. So where he is in Midian is actually the foreign context. For him, that is the strange land. He has, he has gone to a strange land, he has married a woman, and now he has a child. This is, um, it's, it's a, it's a product, it's a, it's a result of his being in a foreign land. He's found a foreign wife and he has a kid and it's strange. He, he, it, but nevertheless, it is a name, okay, it's a name. Now we also have in, so we've talked about human naming. Now we are gonna talk about divine naming. So Moses uh, has these interactions with God and yet Moses does not know what this, what the name is of, the, of this, I don't know, divine being with whom he is interacting. So Moses said to God, when I come to the Israelites, when he returns to Egypt, and I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? So God says to Moses, Eya asher Eya, which um, which in English doesn't do any justice at all to what that actually means. In Hebrew, Eya Asher Eya really better translates to I will be whom I will be. It's fairly uh, existential. I, I will simply be. I am existence. I am and I will continue to be. Right? And we even in the Tetragrammaton, this four-lettered name of God, we have resonances of this, which is really about being, existence, really. So this Eya, Asher Eya, I am about existing. I am existence itself. And then he shall, you shall say to the Israelites, Eya sent me to you. <laughs> like this, this existence, this divine existence sent me to you. So it's not, which... Which actually, when we think about the broader context of what's going on and various gods, this is pretty interesting because it's not about the god of thunder, the god of water, the god of agriculture, or any other particular god of, of anything. It's just an overarching master god, but also not a particular thing, but some something more existential, more broadly, not ephemeral, but... 
uh, actually the opposite of ephemerality, the opposite of ephemeral, something that is that just continues to exist and is perhaps even the, the nature of existence and the, the controller of all existence, which is um, further interesting. But then, not content with that, God continues in, in verse 15. God says further to Moses, thus shall you speak to the Israelites. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This shall be my name forever. This is my appellation for all eternity. In Hebrew, This is, um, it's actually interesting. This is my name forever. And this is my remembrance from generation to generation is, is a better translation. It's a more accurate translation. So it's not just simply naming, it's also about uh, zikri, it's about uh, remembering. Uh, losing place, okay. So that this is, this is my name, which is interesting. It's not, again, it's not a particular God of agriculture or the of trees or anything like that. The Lord of, the Lord, the God <coughs> of your fathers, the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. It's, it's just a broad, it's really about this relationship that our ancestors, the, the foundational ancestors of our people, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that God, the God that we have a relationship that God has really made, um, made our people into what it is. This, this founda these foundational forefathers and their relationship uh, with this divine being who's made everything happen, which is interesting because I find that deeply fascinating. That's really the name that you show. That's like your code word. That's your password <laughs> in, in being sent to the leaders. This is your password. This is what you need to tell them. This is my name. <sighs> but that's not the only name because we see this is an interesting thing. We have literally uh, the very beginning of chapter six is the last verse in our our Torah portion this week and actually continues into these uh, few, first few verses into next week's Torah portion, which technically they're part of next week's Torah portion, but they're still, I think, relevant, especially as they sort of liter like in a literary envelope of sealing off, just as we started with this week's Torah portion and talking about the sons of Israel, we have, again, God providing a divine name. So God spoke to Moses and said to him in Verse 2, I am the Lord, Ani Hashem. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai. So I already mentioned to you earlier, you should tell everybody, my name is the God of Jacob, uh, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of J Jacob. Now he says, yeah, I appeared to them. I actually gave them a different name as to who, who my identity was. That is El Shaddai. Now El Shaddai, uh, which um, is... I would translate it as God of enoughness. Shaddai, um, Shaddai. It's, it's often like, I don't know, a sufficient God of God who, of provision. But I did not make myself known by, I did not my, make myself known to them being Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by that name. Um, but actually, um, you shall, um, yeah, I am the Lord. Ani Hashem. Ani I don't know. So I'm giving, I'm giving you a different name. And I think this name isn't just about a name. It's also about a relationship. That my relationship with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was one relationship. I'm going to create a different relationship with you, uh, the children of Israel. So um, that for me, I think is, is really, I, I hadn't really thought about these things that way for uh, this uh, before in this week's Torah portion, but I don't, it's really fascinating the way it develops that this week's Torah portion is not a half, yes, it, it happens to be that's the second word of the week, this week's Torah portion, but it also happens to work out that naming and names are actually a, a common theme throughout this week's Torah portion and retain a certain significance in what's going on in this week's Torah portion. So I found that really fascinating as far as names not only as far as human naming, but even for divine naming, and also what that says about relationships. We did have Moses giving his firstborn son, Gershom, a name that says a little bit about his relationship to his wife, but also more significantly about his relationship to place, where he is, 
uh, both geographically as well as culturally. We also, however, have this divine name that says something about relationships, the relationship with God, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai is a different relationship than he has with the children of Israel, which is Ehiya Asher Ehiya. I will, I will be whom I will be. I am Adonai. I am the Lord. So, um, thoughts, comments, questions, queries on names? I like it. I'm really enjoying it. Okay. Um, I'm enjoying the actual factual reading of it, of oh, the Torah. Um, so, in this reading, uh, God or God recognizes Moses. Is that correct? God recognizes Moses. He speaks to him. God speaks to Moses. Right. Yeah. So he recognizes him mm -hmm. and he declares that um, he is the leader of the Israelis. It's Israelites, correct? Not necessarily as the leader, although to some extent, yes, but more as someone who can catalyze the the change in in situation for the Israelites. That the Israelites are stuck in a, a bad situation where they're enslaved, their sons are being thrown into the Nile. It is a it is a bad situation. So Moses is being tapped by God to get them out to to catalyze a, a better future for the children of Israel. How long, approximately? Did it go that the Pharaoh was killing the, the boys of um, the Israelites? That is a really good question. I don't know the answer off the, offhand, to be, to be honest, but I, that is a good question. I will have to look into it. Well, I'm curious because it talks about uh, being rescued from the Nile and he grows up. And then he comes as an adult to the Pharaoh. Well, is this Pharaoh a new Pharaoh that um, his uh, adopted mother is related to? Or is this um, an old one? Why did the Pharaoh all of a sudden decide to kill all of the uh, Jewish boys? Why? At birth. Why? At birth. Mm -hmm. uh, let me bring that up because uh, actually, no, I can probably just bring it up on screen here. Here we go. We have in, in this is the first chapter in verse eight. A new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, "Look, the Israelite people are too numerous for us, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. Um, but then. Huh. Huh, it doesn't actually say why. Although, interestingly, okay, so there are Midrash, let me say this. I, I had something in mind that I was actually surprised it was not here in the text. What I have in mind is that it, the rabbis come up with Midrash a rabbinic narrative expansion that 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 uh, the king, the pharaoh, is advised by his his stargazers, his uh, not mystics, but sort of kind of whatever his advisors, and that he that one day that a, a Hebrew boy will come up and you know be a threat to the pharaoh's power. But that actually is not here. We don't actually, we, we aren't given a clear reason why specifically the boys. It's just simply, although I will say it, it seems to be more here in verse 10. Let us deal shrewdly with them so that they may not increase. Otherwise, in the event of war, they may join our enemies in fighting against us. And uh, like a fifth column, rise from the ground. So really, from this, it really seems more as if the the specifically the boys are a military threat or a physical military threat from within and by killing the boys you won't have young men and um, therefore there is no threat right and that the only i mean the problem with it 
is why not just kill all the men or why not kill all military age men because they would be the direct threat. Let boys be boys. Who cares? I'm not, uh, I, I don't know why, why from the text itself, I don't know why just little boys. It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense when taken from that perspective, which is I think why the rabbis come up with that, that narrative expansion that maybe there was a prophecy that was told to Pharaoh that specifically a boy, a Hebrew boy born as opposed to any currently existing teenagers or 20 year olds who are very willing to just rise up and fight. I think, um, yeah, I think that's, that's where that comes from. Does that help? Yes, it does. Okay. So, um, yeah, that's, I've never, this is good. This is making me rethink that Midrash and, and also at the same time appreciate that Midrash because there's something lacking in the text of, but why specifically the little boys? That's, that's actually unclear from just the biblical text. So, thank you for that. that that's a good question. But it is, it is unclear exactly the duration. How long did, did Pharaoh say all boys should be killed? How, long, how many years does that last? It's unclear from the text, but it almost seems as if it is, it does, you know, there is a duration of years for which that order stands from Pharaoh. All right. Any other questions? Um, um, Faye, do you have any questions? No, I do not have any other questions at this time. Okay. By the way, uh, did, did the, the audio quality picked up when I started using this? Very much better, yes. Very much? Okay, awesome. Very, very clear. Oh, fantastic. Well done. Awesome. So I, I definitely am now, this encourages me to get uh, a microphone for these in the future. For you really, it does, it makes it much clearer. And I okay. think uh, because of our population, that would be a really good thing to have. Yeah, oh, fantastic. But I, this, this um, portion, um, now we stop here where he is getting a name. Yep. And uh, Pharaoh is not, the next portion will be what the Pharaoh is doing to us, correct? Well, there already is in this week's Torah portion as far as uh, making their lives hard and bittering them with labor and slavery so they're already enslaved so that's but are they does it talk about what they were doing as a slave i mean were they building the pharaoh's um pyramid or what or that kind of thing or were they tending the crops or what were they doing as slaves great question so we have it's actually in this week's torah portion we have, uh, they're, they're making bricks, apparently. So we have in chapter five that they are making straw for bricks. So those are not the, the big boulders that they build the, the uh, pyramids with, are they? It's unclear. It, I know that it talks about building Pitom and Ramses that that's apparently what they were involved with the building projects of, although it, there's no specification of pyramids. But who knows, maybe there, there's room that it could be considered that they were. It's unclear. And it does not tell you how they moved the big boulders or anything about it, does it? No, so what we have is, uh, I'm gonna bring this up on screen. In chapter one here that uh, as part of what they were doing they set they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor and they built garrison cities for Pharaoh and Pito and Ramses. So the Egyptians ruthlessly imposed upon the Israelites various labors that made them perform and harsh labor of mortar and bricks and all sorts of tasks in the field. So there are probably agricultural aspects of their work but not necessarily uh, agricultural aspects yes as well as these bricks so it's uh, it's very possible they could have made pyramids. There's just nothing specified as as pyramids. So there's some ambiguity there. Well, and it may be um, 
part of the movie. Yeah. You know, which is fiction. It's, yeah. Although, I mean, any movie being made about this will take into account different aspects of the story and, and will fill in other things. I, I think that's, uh, every movie is going to have its own sense of commentary and midrash mm -hmm. and anything about this. And so what the rabbis do is not with their midrash, which I didn't even touch upon, I barely touched upon this week. Uh, there's a lot of room for narrative expansion, whether in the form of rabbinic midrash, in movie making, in stories. There, it, there's a lot of room for, because there's a lot of things, a lot of questions that arise. What does this look like? How does this happen? What, what exactly are the motivations for Pharaoh, right? Yes. Yeah. All right, all right. Okay, so any further questions? No, sir, I, not yet. All right. Next week, I'll have plenty more. <laughs> That's great. That's really great. All right. So now, the, the Torah portion for this week is Exodus 1 through what? It's 1-1 one, one through 6-1. Okay, so it's 1-1 one, one through 6-1. Yep. So basically, 6, um, are they called paragraphs? So it's five chapters. It's five chapters. It's really just, it's chapters 1 through 5, and then the very first verse of chapter 6. So, all right, chapter 1 through 5, and okay. So if, one, if I went to the Bible, I would read Exodus 1 through, or up to 6? Yes, up to, okay. up to just the very first verse in chapter 6. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. My pleasure, my pleasure. All righty. Well, thank you, Faye and Debbie, for tuning in. And I uh, want to wish everybody a Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom to you. And right. we will look forward to next week. Fantastic. Fantastic. All right, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.